American Dream Under Fire is a co-production of the Northwest Area Foundation on the web at nwaf.org and TPT's Minnesota channel. I thought that this would be the place that I would die in, but uh, now I see that's not going to happen. It's not going to be around. It's going to be pretty sad after 29 years. The manufactured home, it's made in a factory, but the people that live in it, they, that's their home. This is the American dream. Somebody can come in and own a home for half of what they could rent an apartment for. These are not mobile communities. They're not transient communities. They're very stable communities. I mean, we work with folks who have lived in these communities most of their lives, you know, years, decades. In fact, sometimes it's multi-generational. Hilltop was incorporated in 1956. There are 766 people who live here. We're four blocks long and two wide. The sense of living in a small town, even though they're right here in an urban setting. Looking to address the aging housing structure, we partnered with um, Anoka County Community Action Program for a first-of-its-kind revitalization program and they've taken it to other manufactured home communities throughout the county, so we're pretty proud of it. Our revitalization program was real important, important for the people who lived here, important also to help with the image. There's so much negative information and so many negative images out there about manufactured housing. Everybody's familiar with the stereotypes of, of trailer parks. so important to think of them as manufactured homes as opposed to trailers because I think that the terminology sort of informs the perceptions. The manufactured housing issue that we deal with principally is manufactured home parks where an individual owns the home but they rent the land underneath the home. There are over 900 manufactured home parks in the state of Minnesota. And it's an affordable way I think to achieve that American dream. Typically, these communities were developed in lower cost areas where the land was cheaper. And those usually are, you know, were areas that were outside of the urban core. And, and that's pretty much the pattern, I think, all across the country. But what's happened is that we've seen, you know, tremendous growth in many of our urban areas. And as that's happened, there's been more pressure for available land. We're all proponents of affordable housing. That's our business. But the land values have gone so high. And as an owner, I mean, you, you, you purchase this investment 20 years ago or whenever it was as an investment. And now you're looking at, of course, getting the highest return you can for an investment. And you're not interested in seeing people evicted out of affordable housing at all. But it just makes sense both from an owner's point of view and obviously the city benefits also. We are seeing an increase in the number of manufactured home parks that are closing in recent years. Many of the folks won't be able to move their existing homes either because they're too old to be moved um, or there won't be a park or community that will accept them because of the age of the home. We are losing, this year alone, 15 parks in Washington State, displacing more than 700 households. And it's simply because of the value of the land and the redevelopment potential. We're very concerned with the future of manufactured housing, from Brainerd to the Duluth area to southern Minnesota 
and even in the metro area, we're seeing an alarming spike in the number of parks that are closing. Yeah, because obviously most people aren't going to want the park to close. We're with APAC. Oh, okay. APAC, or All Parks Alliance for Change, we act basically as a tenants union to help defend the rights of manufactured home park residents around the state. There's a lot of money to be made off of basically demolishing these neighborhoods. If you can sell the land and make millions, unfortunately, the people always lose, and that's what we're seeing. For example, there's a park in Bloomington, Shady Lane, that we were working in, where we were trying to help the residents to gain stability of the land. I was born in 1914. 92. 92. 90, 91? 92. 92. 92. 92. 92. 92. Yeah, I'm so old I forgot my age already. <laughs> well, I was about, I think, three when she moved in here. And we used to, we'd come and play at grandma's. And I grew up pretty much in this home. And so for me, this home is really important. It has a lot of memories for me. I like the space, I like the windows. The front porch was also really important. I'm crunching numbers, preparing myself for retirement and decided I wanted to scale down. I made sort of a hasty decision to move here to this park. Um, I saw this as a really viable alternative, very respectable. Well, I have a great big huge master suite here, mistress suite. I knew that I wanted to do something different. Um, Little did I know what different was going to be. When we got the first close, the notice of closure is when it all started. APAC contacted HPP and we set up an initial meeting with the residents. When they received the park closing notice, essentially the park owner had already found a developer that was going to purchase the property. Under Minnesota state law, the residents have a right to purchase the property through the right of first refusal. So we talked to the residents about different options that they, that they might have in terms of preserving the park. The options we talked about were a co-op, a nonprofit, a land trust. The response that we got was overwhelmingly that folks really wanted to put in the effort to try and save their homes. a lot of anxiety with people because of the fact that we didn't know, you know, what we were going to do, you know. So it was very disheartening at that point. The county ended up purchasing the park. We, you know, thought, okay, fine, you know, this is going to be where we'll live, you know, forever. When he first got involved in APAC, I was probably 11 years old. And I've been fortunate to be able to help others to take away some of that fear. The county HRA bought Whispering Oaks a few years back. We we're optimistic that that would be one of many potential ways of preserving parks, basically by taking them out of the for-profit realm. It's really sad, you know, to see Ed having to, to move out of the home that he planned on living out the rest of his life in.
first or second meeting out at Shady Lane when we did the first board elections. And I was interpreting that day and I was basically saying to folks, we need, we need some Latino representation on this resident association board. And I kind of noticed Vanessa sort of looking around and so eventually she realized that if she didn't do it, no one was going to. It's hard because I have to work day and night for me to be able to pay my bills and rent and make sure my daughter has everything she needs down in Mexico. No fue posible. I think in her case, the fact that she did have both languages working in her favor, she was born in Puerto Rico, so she does have legal status in the United States, really made her the, the perfect mold for the, the Latino leader in the park. She needs a roof for her daughter, a place where she can call home. I try to do everything, everything I can, because my baby wants to come home. And I'm just thinking about that I cannot have her here for the fact that they might close the park. It's hard. It's hard. You've done really, really a great job representing people. Yeah, we've become friends and um, have shared things outside of the business of the park as well. And I really like this community. It really is a community. Bev's gonna be there. I'm so gonna be there too. You don't need to worry. She's definitely a powerhouse in that park. <laughs> and she's really very respected. And I think a lot of people look to her just as they do for Vanessa for strength. So I think that's like the way to go. We found a nonprofit organization that was interested in moving forward through a nonprofit purchase. CHDC. Community Housing Development Corporation signed off on the purchase agreement. It was absolutely identical to the purchase agreement between the owner and the developer and provided a check for $100,000, signed earnest money, and presented it. And the park owner said no. Which is interesting because the state law does not say the park owner may accept this, the park owner shall accept this. So we actually initiated litigation against the park owner to exercise the right of first refusal and also because there were attempts to undermine the right of first refusal and they were using some tactics that just were simply not appropriate. Once we actually took it to court and we had some victories there, I think it became a lot more solidified for the residents. We need more time and you know really stepping up and becoming leaders in their community, going to city council meetings. The closure of this park will break my grandmother's heart. I would like to ask the city council to just take a moment and imagine this is your mother or your grandmother, and then decide if you honestly believe voting to accept this closure statement is the right thing to do. Thank you. This park is overwhelmingly people of color. 70% of the residents are people of color. And with the park closing, you're looking at a mass displacement of people of color. They're all beautiful people, and a lot of them can't fight for themselves. Everyone in this court is equal. We're all human beings, mm -hmm. and we have to fight for one another. Bloomington has always, you know, historically has taken stands for residents. They were the first city to pass a park closing ordinance. So we're hoping that that tradition would continue. Manufactured uh, housing is a real asset for the state's affordable housing stock. And we have to make efforts to preserve those assets wherever possible when economically feasible. There's room for a lot of people in this process, um, and it's very complicated. Yeah. And so it really requires a lot of working with different organizations and partnerships. to law school for the very specific reason to be an advocate for mobile homeowners living in mobile home parks in Washington State. In the early 90s, we managed to get a state law passed um, the right of first refusal. Unfortunately, the park owners challenged that in the courts, and our state Supreme Court ruled in favor of the park owners, 
and said, you have the right to sell to whoever you want. And so if you don't want to sell to an organized group of homeowners, even though they're going to give you the same price as an outside developer, you don't have to. So that was a huge blow. The Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, which is a coalition of nonprofit developers, housing authorities, tenants' right activists, forms around a legislative agenda every year. And since 1977, we've had a Mobile Home Landlord Tenant Act which lays out the rights and responsibilities of both the homeowner and the park owner. So all we wanted to do was have the legislature basically set up an administrative process. So really we're just asking that the law be enforced. We also in the state legislature again in the early 90s um, set up a mobile home park purchase account. However the legislature has not yet put any money into that account. We're hoping we will get at least one million dollars into that account by the end of the session which ends next week. So, um, we've been through hell and high water. Folks that have helped us have been phenomenal. Just absolutely caring, concerned, compassionate. When the situation at Paul Revere first came to APAC's attention um, back a few years ago, they were actually first contacted about management practices. There were some serious issues. Um, there was almost a siege mentality in the park. It would be the way I would describe it. We informed them about their rights under state law, as well as what they could do to try and balance the power a little bit by forming a resident association. And gave the residents a voice and gave them more representation and I think took away a lot of the fear. We asked the group, what are your priorities? And a resident basically stood up and said, we need to liberate Paul Revere. Owning the park. It was a pipe dream to us at that time. We never dreamed it would ever come to realization. So we started working on that. Two years later, from that meeting, the residents did liberate Paul Revere. They're the ones that control the rent. They control the land. And that's a great model. It's the ultimate dream. It's the ultimate dream where, you know, people really got their dignity back. They, oh gosh, <laughs> it's very emotional. One of the key things to buying a park as a cooperative, and it is really key, is having an owner of a manufactured home park willing to sit down and talk to you about it. We were lucky. We were very lucky. May Valley just happened to be a park that was at risk of closing and with an owner that was really willing to sell. There's more investment back into the property because this is public money that was used to purchase this park and so you want to be able to show people that the public money was put to good use. Lehigh took over the Put in new water lines okay. and uh, new septic system, and then they mm. repaved the roads, put in new lighting, All right. and that improved it a lot. It was um, a great opportunity for the homeowners there. Uh, they got very involved in um, deciding how it would be run once the park was purchased, and they formed a residence council. Did you have to get permission to put up the deck? Oh yeah, from Lehigh. Yeah. Yeah. That's lovely. Good job. Do you think people are more, have more kind of pride in the place right, now or something? Right, they do. 
there's a sense of long-term security. Right, because it's 50 security. years or something 50 like years. that. 50 mm -hmm, years. Mm -hmm. So they feel more comfortable. I think they're a lot happier. I Good. think they're better off the yeah. way things are right. since they took over. That park is going to be there in the long term. They don't have to worry that they're going to face a 12-month notice tomorrow. We knew that we were up against some pretty huge barriers. State law only provides a very limited amount of time for residents to exercise their right to purchase the park and to gather all the financing to do that. 45 days. 45 days is an extremely short amount of time to come up with, in this case, $2 million. Unless something comes through in this relatively short amount of time. It looks pretty doubtful. It looks pretty doubtful. <sighs> this is a blow. We know the situation. There sure. are going to be people that are homeless. Right. As a result of this. Yes. If this folds. Mm -hmm. I had thought about it and thought about it. I'm here right now alone. As you know, Beth, my husband's not here. My daughter's not here. But my daughter needs to come home. Mm -hmm. I need to be stable. Right. I have to work day and night for me to be able to have my roof and my daughter to have everything. It's not that simple. Where am I going to go? I just can't live like this day by day, not knowing where I'm going to go or if I'll have the roof for my daughter when she comes home. I mean, this is heartbreaking. People are losing their homes. These are their homes, and they're losing them. It was very hard to tell Vanessa, Bev, and Vicky, looking at putting our efforts into exactly what you were asking, which is where are these folks going to go? Relocating people. Yeah. Relocating yeah. people and, and forcing full compliance on the park closing ordinance. It's not, it's not the ideal fight that we want to be fighting, but that's what we'll do if, if that's our only option. People are calling other parks. They're calling apartment buildings. They're doing a lot of work right now because the clock is ticking and there's not a lot of options for them. And my fear, based on our experience in the past, is that there will be a number of Shady Lane folks who will end up homeless. Shady Lane's 100 residents have until Friday to save their homes. But it wasn't until the end, when the situation was so very critical, that was when the press got interested. So that was a little frustrating, although I'm certainly really happy that they decided to put this issue up front and really address it. I mean, manufactured housing, it's a hidden issue. It really is. Okay, we really gave it a shot. Within the fight, it's been very draining. I mean, you're, you're putting a lot of energy into it, but I think it also helped bring this community together. Yay! You can't prevent Katrina. You can't prevent tornadoes. You can't prevent natural disasters, but our community could have prevented this. And now it's time for people to prevent it and not let this happen ever again. That's right. I agree with trying to get the ordinance. One of the things that the state law allows for is park closing ordinances. The ordinance is, provides vital protections, but it's definitely flawed. How many people are interested in trying to change the ordinance to make it better? What the residents said to us was they said, even if it doesn't affect us, we still want to work to change this ordinance to make it better. If we can help someone else down the road with our efforts, they're surely going to take yield and help the next person down the road. In the state of Minnesota, somewhere between 100 and 150,000 people live in manufactured home parks and only a fraction of those are covered by these park closing ordinances. So that's definitely something that we have to think about in the future in terms of state policy. So uh, I am disappointed. I thought the legislature would get it. The landlords could have used this process too. It was, you know, it's available to both parties. And um, it's unfortunate that the, the legislature has backed down again, yet again. 
House Bill 2780. It's just going to be an ongoing process of education and really getting um, people involved in the political process. You, him, or the neighbors. Nobody owns your home. They want to push you out to push you out. People drive down the street and they don't even see that the parks are there. Or if they do see them, they see them as eyesores. And they're not thinking about the people who are living in their homes. We've never had to face those park closing issues, but a lot of the redevelopment, I think, in some of the other parks, it's been to make way for affordable housing. Well, I don't know what out there is more affordable than manufactured housing. It's people's homes and their lives that are at stake. This is a legitimate and decent and oh so necessary type of housing. Every person in this country deserves a stable, safe, affordable home. Um, and and that, that, that's an obligation of our society to provide that until we can get to the point where policymakers, cities, public funders acknowledge and agree that this is an important housing resource. We're going to continue to face significant challenges. It is not always going to be the case that it is economically feasible, but many times it is, and so we have to work with community partners, uh, work with the uh, uh, owners of the parks, work with the residents to really dig into the issues and analyze them and understand when a preservation strategy makes sense and if it does pursue it aggressively. Addressing the impact on these folks is going to be a public issue. I mean it's going to be public funding in one way or another. Mobile home living is the the biggest form of unsubsidized housing for low-income people around and I think legislators and economists don't understand that. This is unsubsidized housing but these are low-income people. They would otherwise be in housing that was subsidized by the government. These are contributing members of our community. These are working folks, these are kids in school, these are our neighbors. <laughs>